Come on, so good to see you up there in the balcony tonight. I see you. So glad to have you. Turn around, look at somebody and say you look good tonight. Now ask them back. Ask them back. Say, I hope we look good after this. After this. It's the last letter of the seven letters. I hope we still look good after this one. If you have a Bible with you, I heard somebody say, I know it. I know it. When I started this series, I was thinking about the seventh letter every week. I was enjoying it as we were working through it, but I was thinking because I knew the seventh letter was looming, and it was going to be a, a tough one for us to hear and a tough one to preach. But how many of you know that sometimes we need to hear a tough word, a tough message? If you got your Bibles tonight, I want you to take them out and turn with me to the seventh letter to the seventh angel of the seventh church in Revelation chapter 3, skip down to verse 14. If this is your first night tonight to be with us, I uh, I do want to say that we have been through all of the previous six letters to the six churches found there in the first three chapters of Revelation. And I won't take my time tonight or your time to work my way back through them, but many people ask us from time to time, can they get the notes for that or can they get the previous messages? And, of course, you can get all of that on our phone app. You can get it on the church's website. You can even call the church office and get a burnt copy of the CDs, DVDs. And sometimes, just sometimes, I'll even email you my notes. How about that? You can, have the, you can have the whole kit and caboodle. Well, tonight, I'm excited to, to, again, the seventh letter here to the seventh church. But before I get into that, how many of you know the Bible says those that serve among us, those that, that oversee God's work, they're worthy of the honor given to them? You, you remember reading that in the Bible tonight? We've got one of the sons of this house, one of the men of God that's come up out of this house, Pastor Chris Miller. And Miss Ashley here visiting with us tonight. You guys stand up. Come on. I know you all miss him. I know you all love him. We want to honor you tonight. Now listen, this isn't lip service. I told him he should have called me. He said, why? I said, if I would have known you was coming after the three weeks I've had, I would have let you preach. And he said, well, let me tell you about it. And when he started telling, I said, never mind, we had the same three weeks. I better preach then. But I told Pastor Christopher to give me a heads up in the days, months, years ahead, and we'll be sure to have him back and let him preach the paint off the wall. How many of you love Pastor Christopher and Ashley? Doing a great job. All we hear is great reports down at CT Church where they're leading day-to-day operations with Brother Don Norton and all of their work there. We love you. We miss you. We're honored to have you tonight. If you've got a Bible, turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 3, the 14th verse. Now I'm going to read as my custom and manner usually is out of the New King James translation. Here's what it says. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of all the creations of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, I have need of nothing. But what you do not know is that you are actually wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Somebody say they need a counseling appointment with Jesus. Well, here's what he said in the counseling appointment. I counsel you to buy gold from me, which has been refined in the fires, that you may actually become rich, that you would have white garments, that you would be clothed in them so that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and that you would have the ability to anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you truly may be able to see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous, repent. Behold, I'm standing at the door. And if anyone hears my voice and will open the door to me, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he also with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant that he would sit with me on my throne as I have also overcame 
and now I have sat down with my Father on His throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you would, bow your heads with me for just a few moments, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, tonight the echoes of amens in this room are already signifying and indicating that this is your word and that this is your word for this house tonight. Father, I believe that this word is alive. It is breathing. It is powerful. It's able to kill everything in us that needs to be killed, but it's also able to raise to life everything that is not in us but in you that needs to be raised to life. Father, tonight, my prayer over this house is that you would anoint me, the under-shepherd of this house, God, to preach your word under the anointing with accuracy and with precision. God, that tonight we as individuals would be moved from a place of non-committal, lethargic, apathetic and lukewarm into a place where we make a decision to say I'm done with church that's a bold prayer I'm done with Jesus I'm done with the house of God I'm done with the things of God so that we could walk out and be cold as you've requested or that tonight people would move towards you with a hunger with a fire with a fervency God that this church would get on fire for you that we would be zealous for you that we would burn for you to do your work God I ask that one of the two would happen to every listener under the sound of my voice. Now, if you would agree with me tonight for that, it's a bold prayer, but somebody say amen. Amen. Tonight, I want to talk to us and speak to us on the subject of the church of the Laodiceans. The Laodicean church. You know that in each and every passing week, I have made you aware that scholars over the years and theologians over the years and Bible commentators over the years have given each and every one of these churches subtitles. The subtitles are not made up of man's imaginations. Matter of fact, the subtitles are an actual indictment found in red, the words of Jesus, against every one of these churches, whether good or bad. Tonight, the Laodicean church has been known for many centuries and is known yet again tonight in this house as the lukewarm church. The lukewarm church. Over the last several weeks as we ventured down this road studying the seven churches of the apocalypse and the seven letters of the seven churches of the apocalypse, I have made it crystal clear and emphatically proved that this literature is indeed apocalyptic literature. The literature that we're reading tonight was written in the first hundred years of the inception, the birth of the church. But to be apocalyptic literature, it not only had to have been written in the first hundred years, It had to speak with accuracy, with precision to the events that would unfold upon the face of the earth, the courses of human history, history precisely before the Lord Jesus returns. And that's exactly what each and every one of these letters have done. It's amazing that when we embark on these journeys, begin reading these letters of the churches, that these letters, these words are still alive. They're still powerful. They still speak with accuracy and precision into the heart and into the life of everyday Christians today. Those are not the mere words of men. Those are the words of Almighty God. You know, in the first week when we began this study and this sermon series, we covered the church of Ephesus. And because of time's sake tonight and because I also have a lot of information that I need to share, I won't go into detail about each of the first six churches. But the first church that we talked about in this series was the church of Ephesus, also known as the Loveless Church. But what really stuck out to me in the first letter to the Loveless Church, the church that had lost their first love, is that the the words in red from the Lord Jesus kept pointing backwards to the vivid depiction, the vivid description, the imagery that John saw on the Isle of Patmos pointing to the high priest of heaven and how in that prophetic imagery there was an answer to meet the spiritual condition 
of that loveless church. Then in the second week, we covered the church of Smyrna, the first church which Jesus brought. No railing accusation or no rebuke. Smyrna was a small city. And the Christians in the city of Smyrna were the bottom of the food chain, if you will. They were the lowest men on the totem pole, the lowest women on the totem pole. They were the outcasts. They were the discarded. They were the overlooked, but left out. They were the persecuted church, a church that Jesus had no correction for only words of praise and promise. Then in the third week, we came to the church of Pergamos. And Pergamos is remembered as the compromising church. The church that began to compromise. The church that began to have those around them with twisted belief systems that distorted the view of the cross. It is the very first mentioning of the deacon, of the elder, of the bishop, Nicholas, Pastor Christopher, found in Acts chapter 7, who was raised up out of the ecclesiastical order to serve in the house of God that defrocked from the apostolic order. That means he defrocked from Peter, from James and John. He had an ecclesiastical appointment to serve in the house of God. But there came a day in Nikolai's ministry where Nikolai was no longer satisfied with waiting tables. And Nikolai appointed himself to an apostolic role and he began to devise doctrine for the church which gave birth to the doctrines of the Nicolaitans that said through a twisted view of the cross of Calvary, you can and live however you want with lasciviousness, eternal security, and still go to heaven. Might I remind you, Jesus said, and the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans I hate. It's the very first church where we're allowed to see somebody raising up out of the ecclesiastical order that does not have a divine appointment for God trying to lead a house of God, and it leads to corruption. It leads to compromise. Then in the next week, we come to the church of Thyatira that many of you remember as the corrupt church. This is the church that doesn't just have false teachers around them. Now there's a false teacher, not, not, not around the church, not people that hold the view of the Nicolaitans. Uh, in the, now there's a false teacher named Jezebel in the church, and she's teaching the false doctrines of the Nicolaitans that you can do whatever you want and still have security. Then in the fifth week, we get to the church of Sardis, the church that none of us would have ever have wanted to attend, the dead church. And in the church of Sardis, we see the prophetic imagery come out where Jesus says, I am he that has the seven spirits of God. I am able to bring to life every area of deadness in your spiritually dead and decaying life if you will just take of me. Then last week, we come to the church of Philadelphia, the church that many know today as the church of brotherly love, but it's actually the second church in which Jesus gives no rebuke and no correction, and it was actually referred to by most scholars as the faithful church. They were the church with an open heart, giving birth to the name Philadelphia. They had an open heart towards their community, towards people, and because they had an open heart, he said, I am he who has the key of David. Now I will open for you a door. An open heart led to an open door which brought an open reward. Now we've come this week to the church of Laodicea, the seventh letter of the seven churches of the apocalypse, better known as the lukewarm church. And as we have, and every week, I've got to give you some historical setting. I think tonight, if you've not gotten the importance of the historical setting, tonight will be your night that you will value the historical setting more than any of the passing weeks before because the historical setting tonight is imperative for understanding what Jesus would say to this church. Laodicea was a major city, not a small city, was a major city in the continent of Asia Minor. Antiochus II founded this church in 261 B.C. The name, listen to this, Laodicea. I didn't make this up. I'm not bringing this to the table just for tonight. The name Laodicea, look it up yourself, means the rights or the rule or the demands of the people. The ruins of Laodicea today lie very close to a city in modern-day Turkey that I would try and pronounce as Denzel. Denzel. 
Matter of fact, most of you know that I'm an avid outdoorsman and an avid hunter, and I don't watch a lot of trash on TV unless you think a few sporting events such as the PGA or hunting or the news is trash. That's really about all I watch. Ask my wife. She gets tired of it. This past week, I was watching one of the outdoor hunting shows, and it was a guy that I like to follow, and he's a great hunter, a great conservationist. He travels all over the world, and he was hunting this specific ram, this specific goat, and I can't even remember the name or the species of the goat, but what intrigued me is it's not just a hunting show about guns and bows and camouflage and killing of animals. They actually travel the globe, and they get a, a, a little bit of their segment away to the society that they're going to and anyways for this particular hunting trip they had to go to the continent or the country today of Turkey which would have been Asia Minor in your Bible and as they were giving a small part of their segment of the show to the culture and to uh, uh, the Christians there and to the Muslims there they were very careful in their interview and the Turks explaining that the reason the name of the country is Turkey today is because this country is of Turkish origin, not of Arab origin, as we all in the West would think. Well, they're all Arabs. They're all Muslims. The Turks were the Ottoman Empire that came after the Christians, Crusaders, 14, 1500s, who the Christian Crusaders continued to have wars with, what we would call the Dark Ages, after the Grecian Empire, after the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages hit, then the Ottoman Turks rose up and captured the known world, one of the last major world empires. As they were describing who they were as the Turkish people actually hailing from the continents of Asia and the Orient Pacific, founding their continent, building their empire. Brooke can tell you they went to a spot in the woods, and as they were sitting there stalking this goat, the guide began to say to the Westerner, do you have any idea what these stones are? Why these stones are here and why these se uh, uh, sepulchers are here and sarcophagus are here. And he began to show there in the continent of Turkey today, the woods of Turkey where people would be hunting, were the ruins of the Grecians, Alexander the Great, the Greco Empire that was then overcome by the Roman Empire. Actually, the reason that I took the time to tell you that story today is because I had a shot this past week to look into a television and see that society, see how one society came and built upon another society and another society came. And if you were to travel to the country of Turkey today, you would still be able to see those ruins. During the Roman times, which came after the Grecians, listen to me, Laodicea was the wealthiest city in all of Phygia. Listen to me. Listen to me well. This city was actually the head circuit of the seven churches of the province of Asia. Actually, this would have been the first church that the letters would have been funneled through, being the chief city, being the mother city, setting on the most important trade route to all of the country of Asia, of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey today, that the Greeks once ruled, that then the Romans once ruled, then the Ottoman Turks once ruled. Jesus would have sent this letter through the city of Laodicea first. However, even though one society came and built upon another society, the city of Laodicea remained steeped in Greek culture over the years. You may remember that in the past couple of weeks I talked about in A.D. 17 there was a massive earthquake in what we would call today Turkey or the, the continent we in the Bible referred to as Asia Minor and many cities were destroyed such as Sardis. That same earthquake destroyed the city of Laodicea. Listen to this. However, Laodicea was a cultural center. Laodicea, even in Jesus' times, had schools, had hospitals, had libraries. Are you ready for this? even had banks. Listen to this. Of course, this brought stability, it brought education, it brought commerce, and it brought resources. 
I've already indicated that Laodicea is recorded in history as having banking centers. The banking centers were so strong in the city of Laodicea that they even had their, loan, their own loaning institutions. Hello. That actually rebuilt the city of Laodicea after the earthquake of A.D. 70. And they rebuilt it with their own money because they were the proud Laodiceans in A.D. 60 turning down financial aid from the Senate of Rome. Rome tried to send financial aid to rebuild the city, and the Laodiceans said, we're the proud Laodiceans. We don't need Rome's money. They rebuilt their own city. It's going to be very important. I'm not trying to bore you tonight with history. I promise. Just stay with me. The city was also renowned for its production of a glossy wool material that came to be used in some of the most sacred and precious and royal garments. And this glossy wool was also woven in, woven into some of the most expensive rugs and carpets. The city was also known for producing, I guess you would pronounce this, chlorium, which history says was an eye salve used for curing eye disorders. So far, we're beginning to unveil and pull back why Jesus is addressing them as supposing to be rich but actually poor. Supposing to be clothed, but actually naked. Supposing to be able to see, but actually blind. Come on, am I in the book, somebody? However, there was one major weakness with the city of Laodicea. The water was bad. The city of Laodicea had to have its water piped in from two different neighboring cities. Listen to this. You can find all this in history. The city got its cold water from the neighboring city of Colossae, what you know in your Bible as the book of Colossians. In Colossae, there were cold water springs. Aqueducts were built, funnels, channels to bring the water from Colossae to Laodicea, but it was a span of 10 miles. And when the water came out of the ground cold, by the time it traveled 10 miles in the aqueducts, it was lukewarm when it got to the city. Listen to this. Also, the city would get its hot water from a neighboring city called Heropolis was six miles away, but by the time the hot water came up out of the ground from hot water springs like we think of in Hot Springs, Arkansas, the water was also lukewarm after it traveled the six miles. Now, with all of that historical information in mind, which is imperative, let's jump in directly to what Jesus had to say to the church of Laodicea. Number one, put this on the screen. And the only reason I'm going to spend any time here tonight is because I want Pastor Christopher to hear this. The message in all seven of these is to the angel of the church of Laodicea. Many have supposed and many have presumed that when the writer begins to record the words written in red from the Lord Jesus, and he says, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea, that he is speaking to a spirit being. Do we see those accounts in the Bible? Absolutely. I think of Daniel praying, trying to fast and get a hold to God and find out how long the children of Israel had to stay in Babylonian captivity, in exile. And then all of a sudden, Gabriel begins to come and he's withstood by the prince of Persia. And then Michael comes and begins to war with the prince of Persia. Gabriel gets free and he brings a message to Daniel that says the captivity is about to be loosed. It's 70 years. I see those experiences in the Bible where there is spiritual intervention from the heavenlies, where angels intervene in the lives and the affairs of men. But here's what I can tell you. This letter was not written to a spirit being. This letter was not written from Jesus to an angel, as you would think an angel with wings in heaven. Angel there, put it back up, the first point, please. Angel there in the Greek means messenger. It means pastor. Here's what I'm trying to get you to see. When Jesus got ready to bring about change, when He got ready to bring about transformation, He didn't speak to a spirit being. He didn't speak to a committee. He didn't speak to a consensus of the people. He spoke to a divinely appointed leader, what we would call apostolic leadership, where God takes a man, elevates him, and sets him over a house. Why does God appoint this message to a man? Because He says, I am He that holds the 
seven stars in my right hand. These seven stars are the seven angels. They're the seven pastors. And the fact that I hold them in my right hand means they are there by divine appointment. I sovereignly appointed them as the leaders of this house, but it also means I divinely protect them. They have a divine appointment, but they have a divine protection. They're in my right hand. And he says, I guide these leaders, these men who I've given charge to lead the change in the house of God. I've given them the right and the responsibility to lead because I lead them by the double-edged sword in my mouth. And if you don't go to a church where you have a divinely appointed leader, then you may consider getting into a church that God has raised up a man and put him in a church. You want to go back to apostolic order? That's apostolic order. That's the Bible. You say, well, how does that? Let's just be transparent. Everybody knows I'm a straight shooter, transparent guy. What does that mean for you, Pastor John? What that means for me is that Shane Warren is the apostolic God-appointed leader of this house. And I can be number one and a quarter, one and a half, or number two or one and three quarters, whatever. And that never changes the fact that Pastor Shane Warren is the God-appointed leader of this house. And that when God speaks to him... That's the orders that I execute. Now listen to me. If you don't go to a church where the leader of your church has the double-edged sword leading him, if you don't go to a church where the apostolic leader in your church doesn't have the power to kill what needs to be killed in your life or to heal what needs to be healed in your life, you might want to get in a different church. He says the message is to the angel, it's to the pastor. I appointed him, I protect him, but I lead him. I speak to him, I speak through him. And the sword that he wields is a double-edged sword that came from my mouth, and he should have the ability to kill and to heal what needs to be killed and healed in your life. That's what he's saying. All right, now go to point number two. Point number two. Point number two. I was confessing to Aubrey Moffitt, who's one of my sons in the Lord, and a mentee, a guy that I feel like I poured three, four, five years into now, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, a young man that I'm very proud of, he and Bree, and their lives today, and I was telling Aubrey how when I began to dig into this several months ago and begin developing my notes, I named this second point another layer to the description of the resurrected Lord of heaven. Because what I noticed, Pastor Christopher, in chapter 1, John says, I, John, on the Isle of Patmos, worshiping the Lord in the Spirit on the Lord's day, heard behind me the sound of many rushing waters, and I turned to see a voice. And I saw hair white like wool. I saw eyes like flames of fire. I saw a man dressed in a white garment, a golden sash, feet like burnished brass. I saw the double-edged sword sword in his mouth, the stars in his right hand, and he was walking in the midst of the lampstands. He was saying, I am in their churches where two or three gathered. I saw that, and it made me realize that in every one of these letters, for whatever the deficiency was, whatever was lacking in every one of those churches, he goes back to chapter one, and he pulls out one aspect of that vivid depiction, and he says, if you can get a hold to this aspect of who I am, it can heal what's wrong in you. So I wrote that, another layer to the description of the resurrected Lord of heaven. And in all of the first five, that's what he did. But how many of you know you can't put Jesus in a box? Then all of a sudden, last week, we get to the church of Philadelphia, and guess what I found out six weeks in? There's no prophetic imagery. He doesn't point out the eyes, the sword, the feet, the white robe, the hair. He doesn't point out any of that. He comes out with this. The faithful and the true one. He that holds the key to David. And I'm like, what in the world? Where was this at? He didn't show this to anybody. Now this week, here's what I want you to see. I'm confessing that when we have belief systems and when we surmise points and conclude truths, supposed truths in our lives that are not in line with the Word of God, we don't ask the Word of God to move. We move. Here's what I want you to see. There is not another layer given to the description of the resurrected high priest, the Lord of heaven. We know the vision that John saw is showing Jesus in his priesthood in the heavenly courts as he's there making intercession for the saints. And whatever is wrong with us can be made right with what's right in him. I know that's in there, but watch this. All of a sudden, we get to Revelation 3 and 14, and Jesus stays with this new twist. There's no prophetic imagery. Let me show it to you. Ready? Put it up on the screen. The scripture. Revelation 3.14. 
And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things says the amen. The faithful and the true witness. The beginning of all God's creation. Do you see that? The amen. The faithful and the true witness. And the beginning of all God's creation. What? Let's say that again. The amen. The faithful and the true witness. The beginning of all God's creation. Now here's what I can tell you. And all seven of these, he points out something that's right about him that can heal and fix what's wrong about you. So I'm trying to wrap my mind and I'm praying through, Jesus, what are you saying? And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me. You put them in reverse order. Now what are they? The amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of all God's creation. Now turn the order. Who? Sorry. Who was the firstborn of all creation? Okay. What was the first creation of God? The reason you're struggling is because you haven't read in Proverbs yet where he says, I was the master builder. I was at his right hand. I was the first that he brought forth. You know who the first is? It's Jesus. But watch this. Does anybody remember the scripture that says he was actually slain Before the foundations of the earth. So anytime you see the scriptures, listen, pointing to Jesus being the first brought forth, the son brought forth, what God is saying is the reason I brought a son, the reason I brought a kinsman redeemer into the picture is because I'm speaking to and alluding to the salvation of man. God didn't birth a son to say I have a son. He birthed the son to die a brutal death, to bleed a sinless blood, to save a lost humanity. Why? Watch this. The firstborn of all creation speaks to the salvation of men. Faithful and true means this is a true story. I don't care what the naysayers say. It's foolishness to the world. But God uses what is foolish to confound the wise. Watch this. Watch this. Amen. What did Nathan Morris tell you amen meant? Let it be so, but what else? When you say amen, you're saying bring my life into agreement with everything that was just declared, everything that was just prayed, everything that was just preached. Now watch this. He's the amen. He's the faithful and the true. He's the firstborn of all creation. You flip it and you see a mini sermonette, a gospel message. It's the salvation of man. It's the salvation of Laodicea. This is a true story. And what you need to do is get your life in alignment to get back on fire in God. I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. Somebody in Laodicea say amen. Amen. Again, it just took me a little while to work with it. Speak to me, Holy Spirit. And I realized that what he's saying is what's right about me can still heal what's wrong about you. Now watch this. Now number three. I told you we got to go somewhere this week. Woo, look straight ahead. Just look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. Nobody know I'm talking to you. Until it's time for the altar call. And by that point, you ought to be under so much conviction. You ought to be so broken. You ought to be having to be in a foot race with me to be the first one down front. Brooke said, amen. It's a private joke. I'm going to look straight ahead. Number three. Look at this. The literal message to the church of Philadelphia. The literal message to the church of Philadelphia. Very first thing that I want you to see. I don't have time. I need the time at a later part in this message for us tonight. First thing that I want you to know, and I could read back through verses 15 through 22, but you're just going to have to take my word for it or go home and study it. There's no commendation. Last week, there was no correction or no rebuke. This week, there's no attaboy. There's no you're doing good. No commendation. No, I'm proud of you. No, I see your giving. I see your faith. You're doing good. No commendation. Do you want to know why? Because Jesus has no praise for the materialistic, self-sufficient Christian. I know you've said, I'm rich. I'm secure. I'm well clothed. I drive a nice whip. 
I live in the right neighborhood. I got a good job. I'm somebody. And Jesus said, I don't got no praise for you. Because you don't have a dependency on me. You have an arrogant self-sufficiency of you. You're not hungry for the spiritual materials from God. You're hungry for the materialisms of this world. Watch this. Then when he gets down to the rebuke, he says, spiritually, here's why I'm upset with you. Yes, you got everything in the world in the carnal, in the natural, in the material. But spiritually, you're lukewarm. You're not cold that I could heat you up, and you're not hot so I could pour you out. Think on that for a minute. He said, you're lukewarm. You're good for nothing. And I know you think you're doing well, but you're actually wretched. I know you think you got it all together, but you're actually pitiful. You're pitiable. I know you think that you're rich, but you're actually poor. I know you think that you can see, but you're actually blind. Look what he says, Mr. Mike Wade. He says, why don't you buy gold from me? You're running down there to the banks that rebuilt your own city in self-sufficiency. Proud Laodiceans. We don't even need the money of Rome to rebuild our city. You're worried about taking out a loan at your own banks. Worried about borrowing your own gold. Worried about living up to the standard in your day and age. But why don't you buy gold of me? And why don't you obtain salve from me so that you could really become spiritually rich? So that you could actually be clothed in white. And so that you could actually see. I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell. Watch this. What this church so desperately needed was the grace from Almighty God that could rejuvenate them. Could make them alive spiritually in Him again. That could give them the garments of Christ's righteousness. Dress them in white. And could give them the Spirit's illumination so that the eyes of their heart could see. Here's what he says. Buy gold from me. Buy salve from me. You ready? Be zealous. I wish somebody would do a word study on zealous. I don't want to explain what zealous is to you. You look up zealous. You wrestle with zealous. But I can promise you zealous isn't. That ain't zealous. That ain't zealous. Can I get back on zealous? Zealous is, let me pick up that piece of trash because that's bothering me. Zealous is, let me hold that door for you. Zealous is, yes, ma'am, I'll get that. Yes, sir, I'll do it. Zealous is, is anybody ready to worship? I didn't read in there where he said, we got to be singing what you want to hear for us to be zealous in worship. I didn't read it, and I ain't meddling, but I'm just preaching the truth. Listen, I didn't read in there where the preacher you wanted preaching had to be preaching in order for you to be zealous. I didn't read in there where everything had to be just so-so in the church for you to be zealous I just heard him say be zealous be on fire that's what it means be fired up don't be fired out be fired up don't be fired off be fired up be zealous for me watch this here's what I love about Jesus he says be zealous but let me show you how to be zealous you can be zealous if you're if you're here I stand at the door and knock. And all I'm asking you to do is open the door of repentance so that I can come back in and fire you up. He says, be zealous. Repent. Jesus says, the door that I'm knocking at is the door of your heart. It's the door that I hope, listen, to re-enter. Anybody ever heard of re-entry? 
Anybody ever heard of the reentry program? Reentry is when somebody gets in trouble and they send them to the slammer and then they work you through a reentry program back into society. Jesus was hoping to have a reentry back into the church of Laodicea and he said the door that I would reenter through would be the door of repentance when you hear me at the door of your heart knocking. Let me just work with it. Watch this. Watch this. If repentance is no longer needed for the Christian after we've experienced salvation, then why does Jesus say to this pastor and to this church, repent? Might I also mention that if repentance is no longer needed after salvation, why is this the fifth time Jesus has chosen the word repent or repentance in just two chapters? And can I give you not only his instruction, but his warning? He said, and if you don't answer the door. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> Are you? One third of the crowd's gonna get this. I'm sorry, you're not supposed to do it. Are you prepared for Jehovah's return? Because <laughs> if you're not, anybody ever seen the Jehovah's Witness come by? Jesus was the original Jehovah's Witness. He's saying, Are you prepared for Jehovah's return? Because if you're not, I will spew you, vomit you out of my mouth. He says this, if you'll hear my voice, open the door through repentance. Let me come in. I will dine with you. I will dine with you. I don't have time. I got to go somewhere. I could work. I'm not going to work with it. But look at this. He says, not only will I dine with you, but I'm telling you, the dining process leads to the zealous. It leads to the fired up. It leads to being back on fire. Some of us, I'm going to just say this one thing. Some of us are dining in a restaurant across the room from Jesus, and some of us are dining at the table with Jesus. Some of us are dining at a restaurant across the room from Jesus. Oh, hey, Jesus. And some of us are at the table dining with Jesus. If you'll hear my voice. If you'll let me come in, I will sit down, I will dine with you. Also prophetically speaks to the marriage supper of the Lamb. When the eastern sky splits apart, the imminent return of Christ comes, and this church is raptured, which I've already preached to you and showed you that we were never appointed to wrath to go through the tribulation. The reason the scriptures are so very confusing about the tribulation, it is my personal belief, is because so many people that say they are Christians that are really not Christians will not go up in the rapture. They'll be left here on the earth, and that's why you see God's hand still working in the earth. I told you that the churches will be filled the next Sunday after the rapture of the church, more so than any time past ever in history. History. And it leads people to confusion because they still see God moving mid-trib, post-trib, which God still will. But the church, the bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish is going up before the trib. And watch this. We are going to sit at the table with the Lamb and do the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus. Watch this. Watch this. And here's the best part. As if that wasn't enough. He says, oh, I got to give you this. He says, you're going to sit with me on my throne. So watch this. Jesus is on his throne. Has anybody ever read in the Bible where there's three thrones? I didn't think so. How many thrones are there? One throne. Now you're getting a little jealous for God, right? You're like, well, where God sitting? I'm so glad you asked. Where are you sitting? Watch this. Keep asking you, where are you sitting? I'm going to keep asking until somebody gets it besides Miss Jerry. Where are you sitting? In Christ. And he said, I and the Father are. 
I was in him and he was in me. He said, you are going to set in me. I'm going to set in him. And it's what the psalmist talked about in Psalms 109, 31, when he said, he stands at the right hand of the needy. And then Psalms 110 and 1, and the Lord Jehovah said to my Lord Christ, the son, sit thou at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And what you see is the father and the son seated on the eternal throne of heaven and what I came to tell you is that if you do what he told you to do, you will sit right square in the middle of them. You'll sit right square in the middle of them. You will sit with me on my throne as I, quote me if I'm in the book, if I get it wrong, shout me down. As I have also overcame, do you know what he's telling you? If you overcome, you'll sit with me on my throne. But just as you've overcame, so I overcame him. Because I overcame, I sat down on the throne of my father you were in him and he is in him and we'll all sit on that throne together isn't that amazing what if this wasn't pastor shane's mic and there was a pillow down here whoosh, mic drop i'd be working at dollar general tomorrow i did see tanner petrus needed an archery associate my wife was sure to tag that on my facebook to let me know that i could pay my Tyner Petrus bill if I would go to work there. <laughs> number five, we got to wrap this up. I'm going to skip point number four. Skip point number four, as I have in all the weeks gone by. Pastor Chad, would you please come, my friend? Reason I'm skipping point number four. Would you put point number four up there? Just put it up there. I'm not going to preach it, I promise. But I got to whet your appetite for next week. Put point number four. They may have even... The church of Laodicea represents an era in church history. Just remember that. The church of Laodicea represents an era in church history. Here's the spoiler. All seven of those churches, remember this is apocalyptic literature. All seven of those churches, I can show you date and time where those churches and the subtitle of their church represent an era of human history precisely. When I show it to you next week, you're going to say, oh my goodness, that is amazing how human history has followed the order of the church. Do you want to know why? Because so goes the church. As the church goes, so goes the world. As the church goes, so goes the world. I'm going to show you that. That's what we're going to do for number, lesson number eight, number nine. I'm going to show you all that in the next couple of weeks. It's going to blow you away when you see it. The church of Laodicea represents an era of church history. What's the Laodicea, Laodicean church known as? The what kind of church? Can I tell you which era of history the Laodicean church represents? The era before the return of Christ. Because the church will be lukewarm and they'll be fast asleep. That's why he says, everybody else be saying peace and safety. Get married. Drink a little wine. Have a little fun. Do a little dance. Get down tonight. Mind your own business. And he says, and all of a sudden, shoo, and they won't be ready for it. As in the days of Noah, they were marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking. Nobody was ready when Noah went into that ark. He says it's going to be the same way. Same way. The church of Laodicea represents the era of church history right before Christ comes. Look at your neighbor and say, that's us. I mean, I don't want, I hope that's not us. But that's the general, I'm going to show you. Let me get out of that. Now put it up, number five. Number five, the message for us in the church today. Oh, my goodness. Y'all want me to just stop? And we'll bring, you want me? Woo! Because, you know, they've been getting tight and right at the end of the last three weeks. Number one, I hope they got the sub points. The message for us in the church today, here's what I want you to look at. I want you to look at their possessions. Their possessions. But here's what I want you to know. I'm not talking about their possessions. I'm talking about our possessions. The message for us in the church today, today, their possessions own them instead of them owning their possessions. The Bible says the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He went away sorrowful for he had great riches. The great Bible teacher and theologian Charles Capp said it would have better been said he didn't have great riches. Great riches had him. I want us to look at four P's here tonight. The first one I want us to look at in the message for us in the church today is their possessions, our possessions. I want to ask you something. Are your possessions your possessions or are you your possessions possessions? 
Do your possessions own you or do you own them? See, God's not against you having a blackberry. But God is against your blackberry having you. My wife, look at me right now. Can I make a private confession? About 2.30 this morning, when you was asleep and I was flip-flopping in bed like I've been doing a lot lately, I deleted every social media app off of my phone that I flipped through in boredom. Just not, I mean, I just look, and I know it's stealing my time from you, from my kids. I just do it because I'm bored, I'm frustrated, I don't know what else. To, and I just flip, and I deleted them all this morning. I don't need an applause for that from anybody else. I'm just telling you, I did. You said, I wish you would go walk and pray and talk to God. Didn't you not? Well, I didn't go walk because it was 2.30 and we live in the city and I didn't want to get abducted. <laughs> but I did start praying. And you know what I said? I love all y'all, but I'm going to see y'all at church. I don't need to know when you had Taco Bandito. I don't need to know you went to the dentist. I don't need to know you like this or didn't like that. I just said, I'm going to let you work with it. Because I made a decision last night. My possessions were going to be my possession. My four-wheeler is my four-wheeler. I am not my four-wheelers. My deer woods are my deer woods. I am not the deer woods. I serve at this church. But this church don't own me. You don't own my family. You don't own my life. I think the Bible says it's for liberty that Christ set me free and I'll be doggone if I'm ever going to be put in bondage again. I done lived that life, walked that walk. Those possessions, can I show you what their possessions did? Look at this. Their possessions owned them instead of them owning their possessions. And when Jesus looked at them with all of their possessions, they said, you're actually poor. You have no spiritual wealth. You got everything the Joneses had. Moving on up. But you're still broke, busted, and disgusted. Let's just talk about possessions. Their possessions had blinded them. The diamond in the ring had clouded their view, had, had blinded them because the car they were driving, the windshield just had a funny tint in it, and it kept them from being able to really spiritually be able to see. Their possessions killed them. Their possessions killed them. Spiritually dead. He said, you don't know it. You think you're clothed with all this fantastic stuff, but you are naked, and the shame of your nakedness is for out there. Everybody can see it. You don't have no white garment. What's your possessions doing to you? Look at this. Their possessions were a problem, so you know what the next issue was? Their passion. Their passion. Their passion was gone for the things of God. But their passion was raging for the things of this world. Huh? Their possession. Well, we got it all together. We safe. We're secure. Fired up to build. Fired up to trade. Fired up for industry. Fired up for business deals. Fired up for divine life. Fired up for all this stuff. Crank up an organ, can't nobody dance. Crank up a piano, can't nobody shout. I'm not saying here, but I'm saying when Jesus showed up at the lukewarm church that he was ready to spew out of his mouth, he said, you're more excited about LeBron going to L.A. than you are about Jesus moving in some people's hearts at the altar. Your passion have been affected by your possessions. And here's what Jesus said. Let me show you something. It took me seven messages to get this. And he said, that's a problem. That's a problem. Can I show you their problem? You ain't never going to believe this. Please put this on the screen. And I hope I have time to do this justice. Put that one little verse. I hope I included it. Revelation 3.14. Revelation 3.14. Watch this. I wish I had a little red pointer. Can I show you what the problem was? And to the angel of the church, what's the next word? What's the next word? Somebody shout it. Seems innocent, right? Of. Can I tell you, in five of these letters, the message has been to the angel of the church in Sardis, 
in Thyatira, the church of Jesus that was in that city. Do you know what he says to the Laodiceans? And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. You know what their problem was? This wasn't his church. It was their church. Now you go check me out on that and see if I'm sitting up here propping you up with a bunch of foolishness. He says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, here's the problem. Your possessions have stole your passion. And that's a problem. Because what you've created is by you desired country club. What you've created is Calvert's Crossing. What you've created is Squires Creek, a social gathering. That ain't how my church functions. You say, that's strong preaching. It's tough preaching, but it's the truth. Can I give you the last one? Their possessions stole their passion, and Jesus said that was a problem because they had built their church not experiencing his church. And he said, here's the prescription. Here's the prescription. Do you hear me at the door? Can you hear my voice? See, you thought Sprint and Verizon came up with, can you hear me now? (laughs) Jesus said, hear my voice. Oh, you missed that? You don't believe it's in there? Go back and read it tonight. He said, hear my voice. Do you hear me standing at the door and knocking? Here's the prescription. He says, open the door. Here's the prescription. Open the door. Open the door. And I will re- It started his church. It became their church. He said, if you'll hear me at the door, you just got it. If you'll hear my voice, open the door of repentance. It'll allow me access and avenue to come back in, to re-enter the church. All for the intention of making you zealous setting you back on fire jesus said i don't want to come in just to say i'm back in he said i want to come back in so you're not lukewarm he said i'm coming back in because i want you on fire i want you on fire i want you on fire for me here's what i came to ask you tonight are you on fire now listen i love that i love the holler back you start hollering back, I'll turn to another one in here and we'll just start preaching some more. I love it. And, and honestly, when people are just raw and genuine and real, that's a real good indicator of their spiritual temperature. But I'm also wise enough to know that you don't have to shout amen to be on fire. Are you lukewarm tonight? You know. Holy Spirit, begin to talk to them now. Are you engrossed in materialism? Is your hair color? Is your eyelashes? Your fingernails, your toenails, your car? What you drive? Where you live? Where you were educated? Where you're going in life? Material has... I don't believe God has a problem with us having possessions. Matter of fact, the apostles say in the book of Corinthians that we ought to use everything of this world. If there's a light, let me just break this down to you. The football stadium shouldn't be the only people with the best lights in town. There is no reason that the West Monroe Rebels should have a million dollar sign out there advertising their games and God's churches be out there sticking up 50 cent little pop in letters. I don't believe that junk. That's hogwash. That's traditions of men. Poverty mindset. God said, use the things of this world. Use the things of this world, but don't ever be used by them. Are you engrossed in materialism? Have you arrived at a place where you're self-sufficient? You don't need... Listen, one of the dumbest statements that you could ever make is there is no reason to pray. I don't need to pray. It's not going to do any good. Do you know what you're saying to God? You're spitting in God's face saying, I got this. I'm self-sufficient. And that's not the truth. 
Has your possessions and your position in life baited you into a trap where believing you got everything and then tonight you woke up and found out you didn't have nothing? Can you hear Jesus tonight standing at the door saying, I'll come into you. I didn't come to condemn you. I came to ignite you. I came to set you on fire. I came to make you zealous for me. I came to return you to your first love. I came to take you back to the joy of your salvation. I came to take you back to your sincere faith, to your earnest, zealous state for me. I came to bring you back tonight when you would preach to a china cabinet, when you would witness to a greeter at Walmart. I came to take you back tonight when you would help a homeless man if you knew he was walking in a store to buy a 24 ounce beer. You would help him just to show him the love of Jesus. I came to ask you tonight, would you get up on your feet? Does anybody need Jesus in this place beside me to come Come back in and to set you on fire. We're going to worship all around this altar for the next few minutes.